Hi, this is Tim Weber from South Texas College, and today we're going to go into the topic of therapy. And so let's get our outline up on the screen here, and let's get my face out of the picture, and maybe get a pointer as well so that uh, you can follow along where I'm at. Okay, here we go. All right. So, first of all, let's consider the development of therapy and just how it came about. And to do that, we'll look at how mental disorders were treated in past times. Uh, they might not have been called mental disorders, but um, the uh, behavior, maladaptive behavior, uh, still existed. And so in uh, ancient and up until modern times, it was common that people who uh, exhibited maladaptive behaviors, uh, mentally disturbed, were maltreated. And part of the reason for this is it was not well understood what caused abnormal behavior. And so there were ideas such as the uh, abnormal behavior was caused by possession by evil spirits. Um, and so it might have been thought necessary to beat the evil spirits out of the person, beat the devil out of the person, or um, they might drill holes in the person's skull to enable the evil spirits to escape, something they called trepanation. Um, the other ideas was that there was some imbalance in the bodily fluids, and so they might bleed the person in order to uh, try to restore this balance that they believed was necessary and so forth. And so eventually, uh, it came to the point where people who engaged in uh, disturbed behavior were housed in places that they called asylums. Now, at first, maybe there was sort of a humane idea uh, involved with these, but these eventually became places where these people were simply warehoused. Uh, they were jammed in there shoulder to shoulder, filthy conditions, uh, maybe even naked men and women thrown in there together, uh, fed the poorest of food, um, just terrible, terrible situations. Uh, people might be chained up as well. They might be treated as if they were animals even. In some cases, people could pay a few pennies to go and watch the, as they call them, lunatics. Um, and then they even were allowed to bring sticks where they could poke at them like wild animals. So this really devolved into a very mm, unpleasant. And in addition, they were uh, sometimes subjected to very strange, debilitating or dangerous treatments. Uh, they might be thrown into cold water uh, and kept there for long periods of time. Uh, they might be spun around on chairs for hours on end and you name it, just all kinds of things. But understanding that, you know, they didn't understand what caused this. And unfortunately, they didn't really value uh, people who had these kinds of difficulties. Now, this began to change particularly in the 17 and 1800s, when people like Philip Pinnell in France, Dorothy Dix in the United States, advocated for more humane care for the disturbed. And so they advocated that the uh, people in the asylums should be released from the shackles, they should bring in sunlight, fresh air, uh, they should uh, uh, enable these people to be treated like normal people, even providing them work and useful activity. And lo and behold, if you treat people more like humans, they'll act more like humans. And surprise, not surprisingly, the behavior, abnormal behavior, diminished at least somewhat uh, when people were treated in a more humane way. Out of this whole idea also then developed 
what we now call various types of psychotherapy. And so when we talk about psychotherapy, we're talking about the use of psychological techniques to help people overcome psychological difficulties. And in some cases, psychotherapy also may be used to achieve personal growth as well. Now, that's in contrast to biomedical therapies, which also might be used to help people with psychological disorders. In this case, we are treating the biological elements related to that mental disorder through the use of medication or some kind of medical procedure. Many therapists today take an eclectic approach. In other words, they don't use only one type of psychotherapy or even limit themselves to psychotherapy or biomedical therapy, but may integrate uh, more than one type of therapy. Uh, for example, you might have a psychiatrist that both prescribes medication as well as uses psychotherapy. Or you might have a clinical psychologist who specializes in the use of not just one therapy, but several, maybe a behavior therapy, um, behavior therapies, as well as some sort of psychodynamic therapies. And uses them uh, together as needed. So um, the whole landscape of this is not going to usually be that one is going to find a strict psychodynamic therapist or a strict humanist therapist and so forth. So looking at psychological therapies, we'll look at four basic forms of psychotherapies in this video, and we'll pick up some others in the next video. We'll look at psychoanalysis, which is kind of the granddaddy or grandma of all uh, therapies. We'll also look at humanist therapy. We'll look at behavioral therapy and cognitive therapy. And I, I should have said with psychoanalysis, we'll also look at psychodynamic therapy under that umbrella. Okay, so psychoanalysis, the first formal psychotherapy was developed by Sigmund Freud, a medical doctor in Austria back in the 1800s, early 1900s. And here you see a picture of Freud's famous couch where his patients would lay and they would engage in pre-association. Pre-association being they would simply speak whatever came to mind as Freud listened sitting in the chair behind. And we'll get into a bit of that as to what that's all about in a moment. So here's the basic underlying theory of psychoanalysis. First, psychological problems were thought to originate from childhood conflicts with important people in the person's life, early childhood, or from repressed urges, natural urges that the person was uh, trying to avoid becoming aware of. So the therapist's job then is to identify these hidden conflicts and urges and then give the patient insight so that now they can work through these conflicts or work with these urges as a reasoning adult rather than addressing them unconsciously at a child uh, sort of level. The idea then is that as the patient works through these difficulties, the energy that was previously devoted to keeping all this material repressed can now be freed up for more effective functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. So just how did psychoanalysis work then? First of all, free association was one of the primary techniques. So the idea was that the patient would lay there in a relaxed position and speak whatever comes to mind. And the idea, the unconscious conflict or urge would sort of bubble to the surface and be expressed by the patient. Now it might be expressed in a hidden form. It might be, um, it might be disguised. And so here's where, again, the psychoanalyst comes in and needing to then interpret the content of that free association 
And so interpreting this is one of the key features of what the person was saying. And the psychoanalyst might say, well, you know, this item that you're talking about, I think really represents some other thing, some unconscious conflict or urge. Now, other interpretations are also uh, important in psychoanalysis. And the therapist also interprets resistance. So this is as the patient is free associating, there is some hesitance when it comes to talking about a particular subject when it comes up in free association. The person avoids that subject or changes the subject and the psychoanalyst then sees this as um, avoiding becoming aware of this anxiety producing thing that the person really needs to deal with. And for example, maybe the patient uh, mentions their uncle uh, in that free association and then very suddenly switches the topic to something else. Okay, so this may be a resistance. There's some conflict here or urge that related to them, the person is avoiding actually um, confronting in a conscious level. Now also, uh, we have interpretations of transference. Now transference is the idea that people will transfer conflicted relationships from their early childhood onto the patient therapist relationship, to transfer those things and recreate them in the therapeutic context. So maybe, the psychoanalyst um, notices that the person uh, is becoming almost childish in their interactions with them. And they might say, you know, uh, when you started to talk about uh, your, your mother, uh, that uh, you, you hesitated, that's resistance. But then as the person continues to free associate, maybe for weeks on end, and by the way, that was not unusual in psychoanalysis, the person would come daily for sessions. And so let's just say Freud instead of psychoanalyst to make it simple. So the patient is free associating daily for weeks on end. Freud is simply sitting back there on his chair listening, not saying anything. Eventually, the patient bursts out and says, Freud, I don't think you give a damn about me. You don't care about anything but yourself. In fact, you're probably just back there sleeping and you don't give a damn. And Freud might say, ah, I think we have a breakthrough here. He might interpret that to the patient saying, you know, I think that there is some conflict here from your early childhood. You're treating me as if I was a neglectful mother and that I'm neglecting you when you need my help. And so we need to explore that relationship that you had back from your early childhood with her. Okay, the psychoanalyst might also use dream analysis as well. And here the patient uh, recounts the dreams that they've had and then the psychoanalyst interprets this. Now, there is always then, uh, as part of dream analysis, what we call the manifest content of the dream. Manifest content being the actual people, places, and events, the drama that makes up the dream. And then the latent content, which is the uh, hidden meaning. So the psychoanalyst then tries to get at what is the hidden meaning of that dream for that person? What urge does it represent that they're not facing? Uh, what may be conflictual relationship from their childhood? Are they reenacting in that dream and so forth? Now, with uh, Freud, Freud uh, saw so much of our motivations as being uh, sexual motivations. So often uh, the dream represented some sexual sort of uh, uh, interpretation. Now, psychoanalysis then 
uh, did sometimes bring significant improvement. However, it also was very time consuming and very expensive. And so nowadays, not very practical. And today you won't find very many practicing psychoanalysts for those reasons. However, some of the principles that guide psychoanalysis have been incorporated into modern psychodynamic therapy. You will find this today. So in psychodynamic therapy, rather than a sofa, the patient therapists meet face to face. They may we meet just weekly rather than daily and usually a short-term basis, you know, 12 to 16 weeks uh, course of therapy rather than years upon years. So in psychodynamic therapy, the therapist identifies the central issue with the patient rather than relying on long periods of free association. So the therapist is also more active in asking questions and making interpretations earlier on. However, there is still the assumption that the person is dealing with unconscious forces, uh, unconscious urges, unconscious conflicts, that the root of their problem likely stems from childhood experiences and childhood relationships. So one of the uh, very typical then things that the psychodynamic therapist is going to look for is are there patterns in the therapy that might be reenacting important relationships from that patient's uh, early life and that are then holding that person back. And again, helping them get insight into the origins of those problems and then working through those relationships on a more adult level and a more conscious level. And by the way, psychodynamic therapy has been found to be quite effective for a number of things, uh, depression, uh, some anxiety problems. Um, so it's not uh, completely outdated in terms of uh, psychodynamic therapy. Now, let's shift to another insight type of therapy. That's what psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy is. Humanistic therapies also help to give people insight, although in a very different way. So humanist therapies then seek to empower the person to self-actualize, to move towards developing their full potential. And they do so by helping people become more self-aware and more self-accepting. So the emphasis here is not so much on solving a problem, but rather on personal growth. So it's important to maybe do some contrasting of humanist therapy with um, psychodynamic, uh, psychoanalytic therapy. So the focus of the humanist therapist is going to be on the present time. How is the person evaluating themselves in their present situation rather than looking for the problem in the person's past, their early childhood? Humanist therapists also emphasize client awareness. The client can become aware of them, their, their selves, themselves um, on their own. It doesn't require a therapist to interpret hidden things and then uh, to help them uh, work through them. So the humanist therapist assumes that first of all, the client is aware of whatever the problem might be, um, that they don't have to identify the problem for the client they also uh, believe that the client is on some level aware of the solutions for their problem. And so it's not a matter of giving the person the solution, but rather helping them discover it uh, for themselves. 
So in humanist therapy, the client then discovers their own solutions to whatever problem that they've brought into the therapy. Notice also in humanist therapy, the person coming for therapy is referred to as the client rather than patient. So back with yeah, psychodynamic and psychoanalysis, we talked about that person being a patient. Well, when you talk about somebody being a patient, what does that imply? Well, there's something wrong with them, and they need someone to diagnose the problem. They need someone then to prescribe the solution to the problem. Contrast that with the humanist approach, the person is a client. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, they don't need someone to diagnose what's wrong. They know uh, what it is. And they don't need someone to give them the solution. Uh, they can discover this. They already have that. And so notice that there's a very different relationship implied here. So we're going to look at humanist client-centered therapy. And you know, I think our textbook uh, actually calls this uh, person-centered therapy. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, note that down. We're talking about the same thing, uh, just the name has changed over time back and forth. So uh, this is the same as person-centered therapy. Okay, so how does it work? The therapist provides a growth-enhancing climate. Three things. First of all, genuineness. So the person the therapist strives to be real, be authentic with the person. They're not faking their response to that person. They're not falsifying how they're uh, portraying things to them. Secondly, the therapist provides empathy through a process called active learning. It's one of the particular techniques. So empathy is what? being able to tune into how somebody thinks and feels. So active learning then, the therapist listens carefully to that person, noting things even like their body language, and then tries to identify how that person thinks and feels, what they value, and then reflects it back to them so that that client can hear that mirrored back. Now, when this is done, um, if the therapist has done well, the person hears this mirrored back and they say, yeah, you're right. Uh, maybe, for example, the person is talking about something their boss did and therapist uh, kind of mm, senses that this person is really kind of angry about that, although they're not expressing it. And so the therapist might interject Oh, so you're kind of angry about what the boss did. Now that person might evaluate that the therapist has done well. They'll say, yes, you're exactly right. I really wasn't and thought of that, uh, but you know, that is how I feel. Uh, and then they get in touch with their actual feeling that way. Now they might also say, no, no, you, that's not right. Uh, you missed it. Actually, I'm not angry with them. I'm just disappointed that somebody in their position would do that. Once again, even here, the person has gained greater insight into how they're actually feeling about that situation. So either way, uh, obviously, it's better if the therapist accurately reflects those feelings, because that's going to provide that person with a sense of what really being heard. Have you ever had a situation where, you know, you're, you're trying to express yourself and the person listening to you, you just get a sense that they really do get it, how you think and feel and what you value and that they really have tuned in and they really understand you. Isn't that a, isn't that a great feeling when you feel like you've really been heard by someone? It kind of frees you up. And that's the whole point of this whole business of this empathy and active learning. Now, the therapist thirdly provides acceptance in the form of what has been referred to as unconditional positive regard. This is something that 
uh, was, um, excuse me. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, was explained by Carl Rogers and unconditional positive regard. So this would be valuing a person no matter what, no matter what they expressed in terms of their uh, intentions, no matter what they express in terms of their emotions or their value, simply valuing them no matter what, not passing judgment on them as a person. Now that said, we might disagree with their course of what they're doing, uh, but we're going to, uh, the uh, person-centered therapist strives to be non-judgmental, okay? So maybe they would have done things differently. Maybe they would have felt differently, but they don't tell that person, oh no, you shouldn't feel that way, or oh, well, that's not a good idea. Now that's the wrong way to go at it. No, they uh, are non-judgmental about that. Now, this business of being accepting then, again, enables that person to become accepting of their own solutions to their problem. So here's kind of how it goes. The person senses that that therapist is being genuine, they're being real, they're not faking it, that they really understand them, empathy, and they still accept them no matter what. So if that therapist can accept them, well, maybe I can accept myself and my own ideas. So that's why judgment, being non-judgmental can be so valuable in helping the person grow and move towards their potential. Now, person-centered therapy is also non-directive. So the therapist doesn't give suggestions or advice. They don't even tell the person what their problem is that they're dealing with. Why? They believe that that person, in fact, does know the problem that is uh, causing them trouble. Uh, they do know the source of the problem. And they also do have a solution somewhere in there if they're only allowed to discover it for themselves. So, in fact, the person centered therapist may sit down with that client and at the beginning of the first session simply say, mm, Okay, this is your time. You can talk about whatever you want. Go ahead. And then they sit and in silence and finally the person will begin speaking and they will begin to identify the problem that needs to be addressed. So notice this kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Who knows better what the problem is, the therapist or the person? Well, the person themselves is gonna know better than the therapist. They know themselves better than the therapist knows them. And what about this not giving mm, advice or direction? Uh, that's may not seem you to know, make sense, but think about this. Okay. And again, I when I first practiced, we had to practice all these types of therapy in our training. Uh, you know, and I kind of thought, oh my gosh, this is not going to work. But strangely enough, it did. And as you followed the right course of action, people would actually begin identifying their own solutions. So, and again, you know, think about this. As a therapist, maybe I can tell you what I would do, what would work for me, but, you know, I'm not you. And what works for you, you know what works for you better than I do, right? And not only that, but if I tell you, well, do this, here's your assignment for this week, <laughs> how likely are you to do it? Not as likely as if you've come up with your own solution, you're more likely to follow through on your own ideas and your own solution than something that I give. So you can see how <laughs> at first this doesn't seem to make sense, but it actually uh, may work very effectively for some people. So the end result in this uh, is the client begins to gain self-insight, self-acceptance, and as they do, 
psychological problems like depression and anxiety and what have you diminish and the client discovers their own solutions and acts on them and things get better and they move to fulfilling their potential so that's um, one of the types of humanist therapy and by the way this has been very influential in many different areas not only in therapy but in counseling of all kinds so you'll find some of these aspects and some of this you can apply even in your own relationships and listening actively as we talked about and being uh, showing unconditional positive regard and so on you might find that it actually benefits your relationships okay now on to a different type of therapy now if you didn't like those therapies we've presented so far here's something totally different okay behavior therapy is not about talking and insight it's about action okay so what's the underlying idea maladaptive behavior maladaptive emotional responses are a result of conditioning so if conditioning and learning has produced these we can change these behavior patterns and emotional patterns using various conditioning learning techniques. We can eliminate unwanted behaviors, unwanted emotional responses, or we can instill new behaviors and new habits through a process of conditioning. So much of behavior therapy uses the concept of counter conditioning and this is a variety of classical conditioning which you might remember from our chapter on learning in counter conditioning for example we might take a feared stimulus and come and pair it with a condition that is incompatible with being afraid and so we'll look at a couple of types of counter conditioning here by the way uh, went a little bit beyond the textbook here so you might pay a little attention to uh, some, some of this okay so we'll look at a couple types of exposure therapies okay now in general exposure therapy is based on the idea that the more we are exposed to something, the more we habituate to it, the less emotional response we have to it. And so in one version of exposure therapy, the person is directly exposed to that feared stimulus if the problem is fear, phobia. And so the idea as anxiety will lessen with repeated exposure to that stimulus, the client will habituate to that phobic stimulus. So here you see this illustrated pure exposure therapy in the cartoon, Professor Gallagher controversial technique of uh, simultaneously confronting his client with his fear of heights, snakes, and the dark all at once this pure exposure therapy is sometimes called flooding yeah why do you call it flooding well you're flooding the person with that thing that they're afraid of can it be effective yes uh, in fact it can be effective quite quickly in only a few sessions but here's the rub it's also extremely intense so this is only gonna benefit a highly motivated person and only gonna be effective when it is um, done by someone who actually knows what they're doing. In order for it to be effective, that person must be kept in the phobic situation until eventually they become calm. <laughs> and if you can't keep them there, that whole time yes it's not going so for the highly motivated and somebody who wants to rapidly get over a fear of phobia yes flooding exposure therapy might be the way to go three or four sessions and you might be able to overcome it and you know for example a person has a fear of flying uh, they might repeatedly put them on uh, plane fights until eventually that begins to extinguish and this could also be done through virtual reality 
uh, some studies have shown that to also be effective, you know, the uh, reality goggles and so on to simulate the situation. Uh, I'm still sort of of the opinion though that probably in the real situation this works best. Now, you may be saying, boy, I don't, I can't go for that. You gotta be kidding me. Uh, oh, and by the way, I uh, might mention too, where do you see this sort of approach, even though we won't call it therapy being used a lot? How about the training of uh, military and law enforcement? You know, oftentimes they will put those people through simulated situations uh, that might be generally frightening and this enables the person to better uh, cope with it when they occur, when it occurs. Okay, uh, now you're saying, I don't like that and I don't blame you because that's really intense. And by the way, is uh, flooding pure exposure therapy something for kids? No, this is not something we're gonna recommend for kids, obviously. So there's a second option in terms of exposure therapy called systematic desensitization. Now, this one is great because if this is done correctly, the person never feels afraid, never feels uncomfortable throughout the whole procedure. Now, I say, how does that work? Well, first of all, the person is going to, uh, the therapist is going to pair the person being in a relaxed and pleasant state with very gradual exposure to the phobic stimulus. So let me tell you about the work of Mary Cover Jones, one of the first to demonstrate how this can be done with her work, a uh, little boy named Peter who had a phobia of rabbits. Now for whatever reason, I don't know why, but for some reason it was thought to be important that he overcome that fear of rabbits. So what Mary did is she first found out what would put uh, Peter into a very pleasant and calm, enjoyable state and found out that he just loved eating ice cream. And that was great. So Peter would then in the first session be sitting in his chair, served delicious ice cream and he would be eating his enjoyable ice cream. And then a curtain was pulled back and there was in the very distant distance, a rabbit in a cage. Now, Peter was having so much fun with his ice cream and the uh, phobic stimulus was so weak that there was no emotional response except for the enjoyment of the ice cream. With each session then, the rabbit was brought slightly closer and closer and each time, as he enjoyed his ice cream, he never felt frightened. Eventually the rabbit could be brought into the room and eventually right below Peter's high chair where he was enjoying his ice cream and Peter reaches down to pet the rabbit. He had overcome his fear of the rabbit. In fact, now he associated the rabbit with enjoyment of all things. Isn't that something? So notice though, that this had to be taken in tiny, tiny steps. And so when this is done today, often the therapist and the person will sit down and they'll make a list of all of the things that might be even slightly frightening about that particular phobic stimulus, you know, even thinking about it, you know, maybe if the person has a phobia of taking tests, uh, even seeing that there's gonna be a test given in a course that's on the syllabus, you know, and so on. And so they arrange all of these things in a, a hierarchy of uh, more and more uh, frightening that they can work through little by little. If the person should show any signs of becoming uh, anxious or fearful, then they have to take a step back and um, work back through that list. So it does require somebody that really knows what they're doing. Okay, so what's the benefit of this? The person overcomes that emotional reaction uh, without ever having to experience any unpleasant emotion. Uh, what's the downside? Well, it may take 20 sessions or maybe even more to complete this whole course of systematic desensitization, but very effective.
Okay. So another type of counter conditioning is aversive conditioning. So here, what we have is the client uh, learns to associate an aversive, unpleasant state with the problem stimulus. Okay, so we have a problem stimulus like maybe alcohol might be the problem. So what then can be done? The person receives a drug that produces nausea when combined with alcohol. So having experienced nausea and alcohol together, alcohol then becomes disgusting in and of itself. So this might be done to help people with problem with alcohol dependence, might be used person who is uh, uh, have a problem with nail biting, uh, they might put a very, uh, they actually have some horrible, horrible tasting stuff that can be put on a person's fingernails. And then every time they go to bite those nails, they get that horrific bitter taste that you can't get out of your mouth. You know? And eventually they get used to not biting them. Okay. Uh, and you say, well, maybe they'll uh, just bite them and get used to it, but no, it's really so bad. Uh, now here's the problem with aversive conditioning is the person does know that the intervention is the thing that is making them avoid that problem behavior. Now, person who's uh, taking that drug that causes nausea with alcohol, and so they realize that, hey, if they're not taking the drug, they might be able to actually drink alcohol and not get sick. And so here's a situation where we might use this to help them at first abstain from alcohol, but then we're gonna have to deal with some of the reasons that they've been drinking uh, before their uh, awareness of why this is working happens. So we have to work with some of the other underlying causes of the problem and not only rely on this aversive conditioning because it will reverse um, after time. Okay, now we also can use behavior therapy to instill new and beneficial behaviors. And so uh, this is what we refer to as behavior modification, which involves now the use of operant conditioning, where the consequence of the behavior influences that behavior on an ongoing basis. So behavior modification then is going to rely primarily on the use of reinforcement as well as extinction. So let's look at a couple examples of how that would work. Okay. So we have a child with autism. And one of the problems is that in their social interactions with others, they don't naturally make eye contact with others, which makes others treat them differently. So we'd like to help them learn to make eye contact with other people. So what do we do? We find out, first of all, what would be reinforcing for that child, and it's gonna vary from one child to another. Is it praise, is it uh, a treat? Is it the opportunity to watch some, um, to play with a particular toy or something like that? But whatever it is we find that's reinforcing, we then use that. And so what do we start with? We start with a shaping process. And so at first, if the child makes any movement uh, of their head towards another person, then they receive reinforcement. Then no reinforcement until they've looked more in the direction of another person. And then finally, when they've laid eyes just on the person in general, reinforcement, but then after that, no reinforcement until they maybe look at least at, uh, at the person's head. And then no reinforcement until they make actual eye contact, then lots of reinforcement and some continued reinforcement of eye contact till eventually it becomes a habit. Okay, so this is use of behavior modification. This also might be used uh, using extinction. For example, self-harming behavior in children that have intellectual disability. Now, some of these kids, as well as hmm, other people, 
uh, may do things like they bang their head against the wall. And they say, well, why would they be banging their head against the wall? Does it feel good? Well, no, it doesn't feel any good to them, <laughs> just like it wouldn't feel good to you. But there is a reason they're doing this. I say, why would they be doing this? Well, they've learned this behavior. Why? Because it had a payoff. So think about that. Maybe at some point in time, they accidentally hit their head. And what does everybody do? They come running. Oh, my gosh. Are you okay? Oh, here, you poor thing. Oh, here, have a cookie. Yeah. And so they get a lot of attention. Now, you talk about something that's reinforcing to us humans. Attention from others is, it is supremely reinforcing, especially for kids that might not get a lot of attention. So they then are likely to repeat that behavior. Now, it might not be a conscious decision, but they repeat the behavior. And lo and behold, again, they get, <laughs> yeah, reinforcement attention. Now, at some point, people are say, stop doing that. But you know what? That's still attention. So they keep doing it because it's paying off. They're getting attention. So how do we extinguish this behavior? Okay. Now, here we're going to have to have some control over the child's environment. So you know, we, we have to train everybody that's around them. Whenever they do this, you're going to ignore the behavior. Now, before we begin with this, we're also going to put a football helmet on them or something like that. So if they do this, they're not going to hurt themselves. So then we get them all suited up with their helmet on and everybody ignores that behavior. At first, they'll start banging their head more because they're trying to get that, <laughs> that reinforcement. But when they find that everybody turns around and walks the other way and ignores them when they do that, <laughs> Just stop doing it eventually it does pay off. Now, they might start doing something else for attention, but at least we have uh, extinguished that self-harming behavior. So notice that behavior modification also often requires significant control over that person's environment so that we can have a consistent conditioning process. One of the other applications of behavior therapy might be the use of a token economy. So this might be done in an institutional setting, such as a mental health uh, facility, um, a, um, a juvenile center, things like that. So when the person engages in some desired behavior, they, re they receive some sort of a token, whether that's a poker chip or a ticket, or points, uh, whatever the system might be uh, that is used. And then when they have accumulated enough of tokens, then they may exchange those for privileges or desired items. So some of you are thinking, <laughs> this kind of sounds like maybe something that you had in grade school where the teacher would maybe have a little chart and then whenever you did something desirable, they'd put a star in the chart. When you get enough stars, you get to get extra recess or play that video game or pick, a, pick out a little uh, trinket from the teacher's drawer or something like that, you know, right? Uh, and that's very similar, right? So notice that this is, can be very effective. Um, this has been used, for example, to increase social interaction uh, amongst withdrawn patients in a psychiatric clinic, for example. Okay. Um, the reason that it works is, first of all, you have some immediate reinforcement with the behavior resulting in these tokens. And you also then uh, have a larger uh, delayed reinforcement coming with trading them all in. So when this is used, some people wonder about the durability of the new behavior that's learned. Will it last? once we discontinue the token economy, quit giving out tokens. What we can find is sometimes the behavior becomes intrinsically rewarding. So those patients in the psychiatric clinic who are now interacting with others more often find, you know, it is more enjoyable to actually interact with people than just sit here by myself. Yeah. 
And social reinforcement also can maintain the new behavior as well. So um, a compliment from others that, hey, it's great to see you actually interacting with people more. Oh, you, hey, I'm, I see you've really improved. Wow, that's great. Often just that attention and that can be uh, reinforcing enough. So uh, it's not really hard to maintain new behaviors if we pay some attention to that. Okay, so let's now have uh, a look at another type of therapy, cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy is based on the idea that how we process information and how we think about things is what regulates our emotional reactions and our behaviors. So in cognitive therapy, then, the goal is to help people to learn more beneficial ways of thinking about things. And this can be very effective as well. And let's look at an example here. So a person loses the job if they engage in thinking and beliefs that this means that I'm worthless and that it's hopeless, then they're likely to feel depressed as a result of how they're thinking. Now, the person instead in losing a job, if they activate internal beliefs that, well, yeah, this is just a sign that the boss is really a jerk and that I deserve a better, a better job. In fact, gosh, it's a good thing, actually. And notice then they're not going to feel depressed about losing that job because they have a different set of beliefs connected with that. So how you think about things can be extremely important as to how you respond emotionally. So in general, cognitive therapy is going to emphasize it's not the event that happens that may give you the problem, but it's how you think about it. If you're depressed, it's how you're thinking about events in life. If you're anxious, it's how you're thinking about events that might happen and so forth. So the idea is distorted thinking causes emotional problems as well as self-defeating and maladaptive behaviors. So in cognitive therapy, then the client is often given homework and they may be asked to identify maladaptive thought patterns that are happening. So the client may be uh, told, okay, now this week, uh, I want you to, every time you start feeling anxious, since this is the problem you've been having, um, I want you to, so they may be asked to identify times when <clears throat> they began to feel anxious and the thoughts that immediately came before the feeling anxious. And so that helps them to identify then the sources of the emotional pattern. And so then the therapist and the client sit down and have a look at those thoughts that preceded the uh, maladaptive emotion and they can identify which of these is maybe unrealistic or is not serving that person well. Then the next step is the person, uh, the client and the therapist together work out uh, new ways of thinking about situations. And then the person practices replacing the old maladaptive thought patterns with more beneficial ones. And you notice I say practices because this does not come naturally. It takes effort and it takes repeated uh, work on that person's part. But with uh, repeated work, they may find that those emotional patterns then begin turning around. Now, one of the most prominent types of cognitive therapy is Beck's cognitive therapy. And Beck, in a very uh, gentle way, helps the client to identify and correct errors in their thinking or automatic thought habits in terms of identifying cognitive distortions like all or none thinking or like focusing on the negative. 
uh, also identifying patterns of catastrophizing. So the person might, for example, uh, think about a situation and, well, they got a low grade on a quiz. Well, that means they're going to fail the next test. And then, of course, they're going to fail the whole course. And then they're going to flunk out of college. And then, you know, they'll never have a good job. And they're always going to be, they're going to end up living in a cardboard box. And, you know, all just starting with, I did poorly on a quiz. Notice that's not realistic to assume that that's going to have that kind of outcome. So if we can identify that that's not realistic thinking, but is catastrophic thinking, then we can deal with that kind of thinking, replace it with another more realistic assessment of situations. Clients are often also given in Beck's cognitive therapy homework assignments in terms of reality testing. So maybe the client says, well, everybody hates me. And so the therapist then may suggest, well, you know, why don't you, uh, I want you to do this this week. Uh, I want you to call up mm, six people that you know um, and uh, ask them, you know, um, I want just an honest answer, but you know, what do you think of me? And usually what will happen <laughs> is the person will find out that many of these people will say, you know, I really like you for this or that reason. And of course, they're asked there to ask the person to actually be um, uh, forthcoming and straightforward and ask them to uh, really tell them what they think. They'll find that, yeah, many of those people sincerely, genuinely do like them. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what if the person does this and all of the people they talk to say, oh, no, we do hate you. Well, then as their therapist, when they come back the next week, we're going to say, you know what? <laughs> yeah, uh, those people that you're interacting with, they're really a negative influence on your thinking, and you need some better friends. So even there, we're going to make some progress. But most of the time, people find things are not as bad as they think. I even find that in terms of students um, that come in. Now, I'm not their therapist, but sometimes students will come in and they'll say, you know, I'm doing really badly in this class. I think I better drop the class. Um, and I'll say, well, let's see how you're really doing. Let's, let's check it out and let's find out what your actual grade is. And as we do this, we may find out it's not as bad as they think. Opportunities to improve are greater than they thought. And they may go away saying, ah, you know, never mind. I don't think I need to drop the class. It's not so bad. That's reality testing too. Okay. Now let's move to another sort of spin off of that. It's called stress inoculation training. So stress inoculation training has been around a while, and this can actually be beneficial for anybody, whether one is suffering from psychological disorder or just stress. And so uh, Meachenbaum is one of the initiators of this, train people how to restructure their thinking when in stressful situations. And for example, if one is stressed by taking exams, upcoming exam, one might tell themselves, now relax, the exam might be hard, but it'll be hard for everybody else too. And I studied harder than most people. And, and besides that, I don't need to get a perfect score for it to be a good grade. So when we think along those lines, we feel less stress than when we put pressure on ourselves or when we fail to recognize what resources we might have. So stress inoculation training also teaches people about the nature of stress, how it uh, comes on, uh, what it does to us, and what we can do to reduce our response to stressful situations. Teaches us coping skills like relaxation training, and problem solving skills that can head off problems that might be stressful 
or can resolve problems that are putting us under stress. So that's something that just about anybody can benefit from. Okay, so we're gonna end the video here. Uh, the second video then will take up with cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, we'll also look at group and family therapies, evaluation of other th of therapies and the effectiveness of psychotherapy. Uh, how therapies vary in their effectiveness for various problems, as well as commonalities of successful therapies. Uh, alternative therapies such as eye movement desensitization reprocessing or light exposure therapy, types of therapists, and then biomedical therapies which will involve uh, drug therapies, brain stimulation, and psychosurgery. And then finally, therapeutic lifestyle change that might prevent or lessen the intensity of various psychological difficulties. So that's all coming in the next video. So have a great day. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.